was God's man. Jonah was God's prophet. And a prophet was somebody that would hear from God a message, and his job was to take it to whoever God wanted him to take it to. He was God's mailman, his, his voice. Jonah received a message that he needed to go preach to the people of Nineveh, the Assyrian people. They were a hated and violent group of uh, people that really swept over the known world at that time. Jonah just refused. He said, you know, God, I know I'm your man and my job is to take your messages, but I'm not. So he jumped in a ship and headed in the opposite direction. Somewhere out in the middle of that sea, a great storm came on that ship that God sent. And it got so violent that eventually the men took Jonah at his own request and threw him out into the sea. And sure enough, the, the, stay, the waves stilled and Jonah just began to sink and he was swallowed by a great fish. And, and in that fish for three days and three nights, the Bible says he stayed in that inky, terrifying blackness and God was contending with his heart. And uh, after the third day, Jonah broke and God rescue me from this place. And God heard him and he did. And the Bible says that that great fish spit Jonah out onto the beach. And as we talked last week, Jonah walked straight in and God said, one more time, I want you to go preach to those people. And the Bible says, and Jonah obeyed. And he rolled up into that city like Billy Graham and he started sharing the truth of God with those Ninevites. And lo and behold, one of the greatest miracles in all of scripture this horrid, violent, wicked people. In one day, he turns the whole city on its head, and the Bible says the Ninevites believed God, and they repented. And it said, from the poorest of the poor, from the peasant to the king himself, everybody took on uh, um, sackcloth and, and sat down in the dirt and repented before God, and the city was saved. God said, I'm not going to bring on the destruction to Nineveh that I had planned. And so what a perfect end of the story. Like if this is a Disney movie or a Hallmark movie, this is perfect. Here you have this, this, this man, Jonah, running from God. He has his come to Jesus moment and he turns and through his obedience, the entire city of Nineveh is saved. Cue the soaring music. Right? Jonah leaves on a ship with, a, with his new friend whale following behind, shooting off spouts of water like fireworks. Right? I mean, what a per Cue the credits. The movie is over. Cheer, and we all go home. But that's not how it ends. Maybe you've read ahead. Maybe you know the story well. That's not how it ends. You see, Jonah was so bitter you know, that while God pursued him and God empowered him to do great things, he was shaped inside the whale. Jonah still had issues that he was dealing with. You see, God, Jonah was so thrilled that God decided to redeem his life. Jonah was so pleased that God decided to save him from the, from the deep. But Jonah was not nearly as quick to give the same grace and the same forgiveness to the people of Nineveh. After all, in Jonah's mind, these were really bad people. I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the show Fixer Upper. It is one of those fascinating programs where they take things that are in such terrible shape and turn it into something amazing. Uh, Sherry and I love to watch the show. I unashamedly love the show. They're just good people. I love watching good people do great things. And uh, they will take a house that is just the most beat down, junky old thing and turn it into something like a palace in just weeks and have a great time doing it. And uh, recently I had the most fascinating realization. They, they took you on uh, a little journey on one of their shows recently where they showed you old houses that they had some of their first houses they ever fixed up. And they rolled up in front of this little cottage and they went inside and it was shocking. The place looked terrible. Like it was something that they now would gut and restore and turn into something beautiful. But that was their first house. This was the one that they had, had gone into and with the best of their ability at that time had done the best that they could do. And you could even see it on their faces as they looked around and kind of shook their head thinking, man, 
This is where it all started. Have you ever had that experience where you look back on something in your life that you thought was just terrific? That when maybe it was an art project that you made, maybe it was one of those little towel racks you made for your parents in shop class. And at the time, you know, that little thing, that little, that little piano recital that was recorded, you're like, man, that was probably the best thing I've ever made. <laughs> right? I mean, you just looked at it and you're like, look at that piece of craftsmanship and artistic amazingness. In the second grade, we had uh, every year the local fire company uh, would come in and do fire safety in our school in Cohocton, New York. And uh, they came in, and there were, this year we were going to do an art, uh, an art contest. Like you got your little piece of paper, and you did your best fire safety picture. And then they taped all of these pictures from the second grade classroom right down the, the hallway, right on the walls. And that night, the firemen were going to come in and they were gonna they were gonna judge all the pictures I can still remember working on mine I mean it was a Picasso it was just I spent all this time drawing this picture and put it up on the walls and the next day with bated breath we all walk in to see if we'd won anything and they put little ribbons on some of the pictures and sure enough I walked up to my picture friends there was a little ribbon pasted right on the corner and for a little second grade boy, I was the proudest kid in the entire school. It was such a big deal to me. And I took that thing home and showed it to my mama. And, and it was, and look, the picture was awesome. I mean, in my second grade mind, that thing was going to be worth money someday. Mom, put this away for, you know, a rainy day when we need some extra cash, because that's a good one. That ribbon says so. Not too long ago, my mom's basement got some water in it, and uh, we needed to go down as a family and, and uh, you know, clean some stuff out, try to get it to dry out. Maybe you've been in that position. And uh, I uh, found my mom's special box. Do you have one of those? The box where mom put all the little things that, you know, she thought you'd want to keep, and thankfully, she kept the Picasso. <laughs> so as we're cleaning it out, I find this picture. And I still got the little crinkly yellow ribbon on it. And I turned that picture over and looked at it. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> like, it was just awful. I couldn't even tell what I was, I'm, and in my mind, like, this was, this was a Van Gogh. I mean, this was, and I'm looking at this thing going, man, at one time, that was the best I had. And I thought at the time it was the best thing. But you know, our spiritual lives can be so, so similar to that. It is not unusual for us to make a decision to follow Jesus. And in that moment, feel like we have stood on top of our spiritual apex, our spiritual mountaintop in that moment. We, we cross into that relationship with Jesus and we think, man, I finally arrived. God has brought me to this great place of spiritual maturity in my life. But the reality is, the truth is, that even with Jesus residing in your heart, we carry habits into that relationship that can be so unchrist like and sinful. Here we find Jonah, fresh out of a mountaintop experience, obedient to God. He's gone in. This man has led people to God by the thousands and where do we find this victorious man of God on this pinnacle of his success? We find him with arms folded, kicking rocks, and whining like a child. I want you to open your Bibles to Jonah 4.1. Now, I've told you, you may not be able to find Jonah without looking at the table of contents. For crying out loud, look in the table of contents. Get there. If you got your smartphone, I want you to scroll up to Jonah. If you get to Matthew, you went a little too far. Just back up a little bit, and you're right there. Jonah 4.1. And uh, we pick up the story. God has just told Jonah, hey, I'm, I'm not going to bring on the destruction. I said I would. And this is Jonah's response. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. 
Now, Lord, take my life away, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a mountaintop experience. What a response to the goodness of God in your life. What a response to God doing great things in the lives of others. You see, it's easy to forget who we were when we walked into our relationship with God. You know, we are forgiven, yes. God has given us his grace, yes. We are sons and daughters of God, yes. But are we the finished product that God desires? No. You see, it's easy to fall into the belief that because God has used us in some ways, and he's used you in some way, in some great way, you've been on a mission trip, you've taught a Sunday school class, you've done some service, some outreach here, and you thought, wow, God is using me. I must be at the place, at the apex of my experience with God. But God not, is not satisfied with our current spiritual condition any more than you and I would be satisfied by our children simply learning the alphabet. I mean, imagine going to your spouse and saying, honey, Let's cash in the college fund. You know, five-year-old Jimmy has finally learned his ABCs. As if somehow that achievement, which is an achievement, he is growing, he, is, he has achieved something important in his life. But when we step into the arms of Jesus, we have just learned our ABCs. It's not time to cash in the college fund just yet. We have a saying here at Bridge that we share with everyone that takes our starting point class. I hope if you've never taken that, you'll take that class. It's such a great way to learn how to get involved in what Bridge is all about. But the thing that we share is a kind of a philosophy of ours here, and it is come as you are, but don't stay where you are. Come on to bridge with all of your issues and your, your sin problems and your cussing and your chewing tobacco and your divorce and all your brokenness in your rated R movies and come. That's what the church is for. Come on into the arms of Christ and allow him to begin to work. But don't stay there. Don't stay in that place that you arrived in. It is important to recognize that we are forgiven, yes, but we're still a diamond in the rough. There's still so much work to be done. I love this scripture in Ephesians 4.14. Paul reminds us that no longer be immature like children. No longer be immature like children. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ. This isn't a, a message to teenagers or children. Paul here is writing to Christian people who are adults. No longer be immature like children. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Now, I'll never forget the first time I led a devotional. Sherry and I were brand new youth sponsors at the little home church that I grew up in. We were just fresh out of the oven as Christians. I was 22 years old. Sherry must have been about 21. We had just gotten our lives on track with the Lord. And for whatever reason, we went back to our home church and they said, you should work with the teenagers. <laughs> like, you don't know what you're asking. And uh, we, so we, we didn't know any better. We said, yes, you know, what do you know? They want you to serve, you're new, you just want to obey Jesus. And so we did. And uh, Richard and Fanny Miller were the leaders of that group. He was a local doctor in Stewart's Draft, great couple. And another couple there were you sponsors. And I'll never forget they came to us and said, Stacy, we think you ought to lead the devotional this week. <laughs> what? Yep, we think you ought to lead the devotional this week. Okay, well, I didn't know any better. They didn't really give me any directions or any place to start. Uh, but uh, I was determined to do it. And uh, thankfully for me, while I didn't really know much about the Bible, I had just been to an Amway convention the week before. <laughs> I mean, it was one of the most soaring and amazing experiences of my life. They had us so pumped up when we left that place. I had a little yellow legal pad, and I wrote down all these great sayings from these famous people. I mean, great leaders and, and Winston Churchill, and I've gotten so I don't know what I'm going to do in this devotional. So I decided I'm just going to read this legal pad. And so it was my night to speak, and I was still working full time. I was a cabinet maker. 
And I came in still dusty from the shop and I sat down and that, you know, at that time uh, they put all the teenagers in the basement. That's just where they put us, you know, old green couches from some grandparents' yard sale and a couple metal chairs. And we got our little youth group in a circle and I sat down and the only thing I remember was it was real hot in there and I was sweating a lot. <laughs> And I sat down and literally uh, Richard or Fanny prayed and then they just kind of looked at me. And so I looked down at my legal pad and for the next, I don't know how long, I just read the legal pad. That's it. That was my devotional, man. I burst into a litany of quotes from Zig Ziglar and Vince Lombardi and Helen Keller and Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan. And I'm telling you, I was just getting after it. And I don't remember a single thing I said. <laughs> Right? I mean, I just burst, but it was, it was, there is no TED talk that had that much fire in it than it, that little devotional. And those kids were just listening and paying attention. And then I, I just finished. Like, I just got to the bottom of the page and I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I didn't even look up. I, I literally, I just kind of kept looking at the paper. Like, I don't know how to transition from here. I'm at the bottom of my devotional and some wonderful youth sponsor decided to break the ice by starting a little smattering of applause and those 20 high school kids just out of the pity in their heart joined in and I just kept staring at my paper listen I to my memory nobody got saved that night I'm not even sure Jesus name entered into the picture they didn't mention him at the Amway convention so he didn't get to be a part I am pretty sure, however, that about 14 of those kids couldn't wait to join Amway. I mean, they were like, sign me up. Where do I get my kit? Listen, what if God had been satisfied with that 22-year-old kid right where he was? What if God decided that the day that you accept Jesus, that's all I need. I'm going on to the next one. What if God had decided to, to leave me where he found me? But he doesn't. You see, at 22, my inability to speak in public was the least of my flaws. There was a whole litany of issues in my life. I had more issues than National Geographic in my life. There were so many things that needed to be rooted out and worked through and smoothed over. You see, God was not finished with me yet. God is not finished with Jonah yet. And friends, if you'll hear one thing today, if you leave with this one idea, it would be that God is not finished with you yet. I don't care how long you've been a Christian or if you are not a believer at all, God is not finished with you yet. Pick this back up in verse 5. Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. What a picture. This is God's man, God's prophet, as he sits there cross-legged with his chin in his hands, watching to see if a city will be destroyed, full of people, full of children. You see, there is something wrong in Jonah's heart. He has become obedient in his mind, and he's following God's command through obedience, but his action and his heart have not yet caught up. Follow again in verse 6. God is about to illustrate something to Jonah. He's going to give him a physical illustration of the lesson he's trying to teach him. It says, Then the Lord provided a leafy plant, and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm and chewed through the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Now, I don't know if you've ever illustrated something or tried to explain something to someone. 
Like maybe you were having an issue with your wife and you just couldn't connect on this thing and you were trying to explain. Maybe it's your child and you're just trying to help them understand why you're doing what you're doing or a boss, a coworker, and you just feel like you nailed it. You know, you'd be like, I couldn't have explained that any better. Like you illustrated, you painted a picture of, of exactly what you're trying to say, and you made your point, and you knocked it out of the park. The, the, it was so clear you could smell the paint, right? I mean, you just knew that your wife was going to be like, you know what, honey, you're right. You're right. You know, that your, your teenage son was going to say, you know what, Dad? Now I've finally connected with you. Great job. <laughs> Right? I mean, you, you've, you have. You've said something that is so clear that obviously, and God has not just said something to Jonah that's clear. He just grew a plant over his head. Like he just showed him, hey, is it fair that I just gave you a plant that protected you from the sun and took it away? Is it fair that I have given grace to the Ninevites? Was it fair that I gave grace to you, a sinful old prophet out in the ocean? And so you would think this great prophet of God who has his own book of the Bible would say, you know what, God, you're right. I, now I understand. Jonah's response is in verse 9. God says, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? And Jonah says, it is. I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Listen, God has got so much work in store for you and I, so much shaping and movement, a reality that we share routinely here at Bridge. This is such an important illustration, is that the day you decide to follow Jesus is not the day you cross the finish line. The day you decide to follow Jesus, that you're, stay, you know, that those pictures of those people finishing a marathon and their legs are given out and they're struggling in and they, they lean across that tape and fall into the arms of some person. In our spiritual lives, that's how we see ourselves, that we've crossed the finish line. The reality is, is that all those people that clapped the day you got baptized, all those people that cheered the day you got baptized, those weren't the people at the finish line. Those are the people at the starting line. And they're saying, listen, we know you stumbled across here with everything given out. You, you just barely got here. And now we're cheering because the journey has just begun. Rest up. Brace yourself. Eat some of those crazy energy bar things that runners eat. You know, get some spiritual nourishment in your body because the journey ahead is going to be way more satisfying, but it can also be way more difficult than the one you were just on. <clears throat> the author of the book of Hebrews says this so well. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. <clears throat> Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Let me read that to you again. You and I are in a race. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. The gun has sounded. You have people, that's what the church is for. This is your cheering section. They want you to go. They want you to grow. They want you to learn. You see, I believe this about each person in this room, and I mean this. This is not some rah-rah speech. I believe that your future holds something amazing, something profound. But I don't believe that you can achieve it in your current condition. I believe that the mountain that God is asking you to climb is going to require work. It is going to require a commitment to following and running the race and, and building up your spiritual endurance. Like Jonah, you have made a decision to be obedient to God's call, but that's just the beginning. 1 Peter 2.1, we see this uh, same theme as Peter says, So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit and hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow. So that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of of the Lord's kindness. You've had a taste. 
God has given you a glimpse of his goodness, but he's saying, I'm not done. There is so much more in store for you. You see, I believe that in your life and in mine, that your best will be found at the intersection of God's will and your preparation for it. God has given you free will. He has given you the ability to choose whether to take what is his best. And he has this intersection in your life, this point in your life that he sees your best. He sees your greatest life. And someday you're going to cross through that intersection. And will you be ready? Will you have built up your spiritual maturity, your spiritual exercise, your spiritual wind to the point that you can take advantage of that point in your life? Somewhere for you there is a victory. But I believe you'll only see it by lacing up your spiritual tennis shoes and getting down to the business of training for that great moment. The Apostle Paul gives us this challenge about how we should run the race of life. He says, in a race, all runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. You see, Jesus gave us the perfect example of what it means to have an impossible race set before you. A race that promises heartache and pain. And that would, a race that Jesus knew before he ever stepped across the starting line would cost him his life. And yet because of the prize that waited, because of the victory that waited at the finish line, Jesus said, you know, it's going to cost me everything. But when the gun sounded, he went. And he won a victory at the end of that race, not only brought prestige to the name of Jesus Christ, that is the name today that has impacted the world like none other. But each person sitting in this room today received a prize because of Jesus and the way he ran the race. You're going to receive a, a little tray today as we remember God's great commitment, his great sacrifice on our behalf. There's going to be little pieces of bread that represent his body broken in that great race. Little cups of juice that represent his blood shed as he crossed that finish line and gave up everything he had so that you and I could live with him for eternity. Let's pray. God, I just want to thank you for running with excellence. So you were a man that felt all of the temptation and all of the pressures of life. You ran in excellence and perfection. And God, because of that, you have given us the opportunity to be excellent and to run this race with purpose and meaning. God, would you strengthen us for it? In Jesus' name, amen.